Good morning and welcome to today's Finance Committee meeting. My name is Julissa Ferreras Copeland and I hear myself. Okay. <laughs> Just like the Yankees there. In in, oh, <laughs> I was in stereo there. Um, I am the chair of the committee. We've been joined by council members Rosenthal, Carnegie, and Vallone. Today the committee will be considering two items that address the critical problem of deed fraud. Deed fraud, which involves the fraudulent transfer of property ownership to a third party, has been increasingly prevalent in the years following the 2008 foreclosure crisis particularly with the significant rise in property values across the city. Many of our most vulnerable homeowners, such as seniors, are the prey of unscrupulous scammers. Discovery of the fraud can occur too late when homeowners are in the process of losing their homes to foreclosure and can have devastating financial and emotional consequences. The first item, Introduction 1673, which I have co-sponsored with Councilmember Rosenthal, would codify the Department of Finance Notice of Recorded Documents program while providing us valuable data on both utilization of the program and referrals to the city sheriff of suspected deed fraud. The Notice of Record Recorded Document Program, which DOF first implemented in 2011, allows property owners to sign up to receive notifications when documents affecting our ownership interests have been recorded against their property. Individuals receiving the notification are directed to check ACRIS and view the documents for potential issues. This gives homeowners the opportunities to act early and swiftly when a fraudulent document that could impact their property interests has been recorded. This important tool is essential in helping the city combat attempts at deed fraud. The committee will also consider resolution number 1421, sponsored by Councilmember Paul Vallone. According to the Department of Finance, one of the most ripe targets for deed fraud are people who inherit property and do not record the deeds to that property, indicating their ownership. While the notice of recorded document systems could al al alert uh, these homeowners of fraudulent record de recorded deeds, owners must first record the deed conveying their interest in the property before they can receive notifications. This res resolution therefore calls upon the New York State Legislature to, legislature to pass and the governor to sign legislation to require all real property conveniences conveyances to be mem memorialized by a recorded deed. We must ensure that all rightful owners of property can proactively take steps to prevent the loss of their homes to fraud. I look forward to discussing these measures as well as broader efforts to protect homeowners and fight deed fraud in the city with the city sheriff and the city register. I also look forward to hearing from the advocates who work with homeowners who have been the victims of this crime. Um, welcome and thank you for being here today. Before we begin, I'd like to turn the mic over to Councilmember Vallone, followed by Councilmember Rosenthal, and then we will hear from you, Sheriff. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, members, Councilmember Hill Rosenthal, for joining me on the resolution as I join on your legislation. So here we are in 2017, and we still don't have, you would think, a simple requirement to make this recording mandated by law to protect all of our homeowners. So our, our Chair just gave the base of facts as why, and I'm not going to restate those, but it's so important to protect our property owners with this simple requirement of recording that the deed be filed in the county, and the second step that all parties to the transaction sign the deed. Um, we have too many times where a fraudulent situation against a senior where they did not know the property was fraudulently transferred either through forgery or some other means uh, that they no longer owned it and faced a foreclosure now because that uh, the, the pr party that stole the property has now financed the house to the roof and the next thing they know they're being foreclosed on and didn't realize it or through an inheritance process where the heirs at law or the family members did not protect the interest or did not know that the estate passed them a piece of property. You have different scenarios where deed fraud can step in. So therefore we call on Albany to uh, pass legislation to allow the city to make these changes and requirements, and we're also asking on Councilmember Rosenthal's legislation two com very important components to protect the most vulnerable of the city. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Madam Chair and Councilmember Vallone. Uh, you're absolutely right, once again, stymied by the state. 
Um, so thank you, Chair Ferris Copeland, for calling this hearing and for your leadership and partnership on this issue. Of course, this all came to light under an oversight hearing that you called. Deed registration fraud is a serious crime with serious impact on its victims. Some months ago, a constituent walked into our office uh, and described the toll of being victimized by deed registration fraud had caused her following the loss of her parents. Her family's home in Queens was stolen and occupied by a criminal who forged a deed and took possession of the home. Even once the crime had been discovered, it was a long, arduous, and expensive process to set things straight. What's clear is that we as a city have to do more to protect New Yorkers in their homes. That's why I sponsored Introduction 1673, and it's why I call it the Marin Hirschman Act in honor of her family. And I'm honored that we'll hear from Jennifer Marin this morning. In recent years, the Department of Finance has made some critical reforms to protect homeowners and keep them alert to the risk of deed fraud. Intro 1673 would codify the Notice of Recorded Document Notification System and establish a reporting system in order to establish a principle of ongoing public accountability and city council oversight. It would also establish a reporting requirement on the investigations the city sheriff makes into potentially fraudulent deeds. This legislation, along with Council Member Vallone's resolution calling on the state to improve the deed registration process, represents a new commitment on behalf of the City of New York and the City Council especially to protect homeowners from fraudsters. I again thank Chair Ferris Copeland for holding this hearing and for sponsoring this legislation with me, and I look forward to hearing from the administration and from the public. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to have members coming in and out throughout the day. There's other committees that are happening, so um, don't judge walking in and out by the interest. Um, but I wanted to thank both my colleagues for their leadership on this issue. Sheriff, after you're sworn in by the council, you may begin your testimony. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committee today and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Good morning, Chair Ferreras Copeland and members of the Committee on Finance. I am Sheriff Joe Facito. I am joined by Annette Hill, the Assistant Commissioner for Land Records and the City Register. <clears throat> the Department of Finance is working aggressively to combat deed fraud because when the criminal succeeds, people lose what may be their largest asset, their homes. What is deed fraud? Deed fraud is a very serious crime. It happens when someone transfers your property out from under you without your consent or permission, or when you sign over your property to someone else by mistake because you were misled or tricked in a transaction. Those deeds are then used to commit other fraudulent activities, such as securing mortgages, setting up phony short sales, and renting properties that are in foreclosure. Deed fraud is a crime that targets our most vulnerable citizens, the elderly, minorities, and immigrants, those who may be less savvy about real property transactions. <clears throat> there are higher incidents of deed fraud in gentrifying communities, which is why DOF has held town halls focused solely on deed fraud in their neighborhoods. We are committed to combating it with every resource that we have. What is the city doing to protect people? The most important step is to make it harder to present fraudulent deeds for recording in the first place. Once a fraudulent deed is recorded, the rightful owner has to spend time and money to prove ownership. Our challenge is that by law, the city register is required to perform the ministerial act of recording a deed as long as it is in a recordable form, meaning it is certified by a public notary, it has a seller's signature and a buyer's signature under certain circumstances, and includes all other required legal documents. There is not much room for us to negotiate the law. This is a challenge for municipalities throughout the country. The job of the city register is to record documents and they have a legal obligation to do so. The sheriff's office has played an integral role in the efforts to curtail deed fraud. 
Our deputy sheriffs are trained to better detect forged and fraudulent documents and put the sheriff's office in the review process. We also automatically inform property owners by mail when a deed is filed against their property and encourage them to register for our opt-in notification program where we will send emails or text alerts when documents are recorded against their property. The quicker someone catches fraudulent activity, the quicker the problem can be resolved. <coughs> Excuse me. Examples of types of recordings that would trigger an additional review are those with a sale price far below market value, multiple transfers between LLCs in a short period of time, or transfers by people or entities known to have committed or have been suspected of deed fraud in the past. These changes have had a real effect. Since July of 2014, when we increased our focus on this issue, more than 1,973 cases have been referred to the Sheriff's Office. We have closed out 1,119 cases. We have completed 96 criminal investigations with district attorney's offices and have 236 ongoing investigations. We've made 37 arrests for 54 properties, which have a total market value of approximately $40 million. We are continuously assessing and evaluating our operations to enhance ways to detect fraud. We are hiring more deputy sheriffs to handle the growing number of cases and looking at how technology can be used to improve detection. In these efforts, we are encouraging New Yorkers to be proactive. In our communications, we tell them, if there is activity on your property records that is not legitimate, please call or walk into the sheriff's office and file a complaint. We have included a phone number and our web contact information for the sheriff's office at our website, which is nyc.gov slash finance. Victims of deed fraud or those who suspect fraud may also reach out to any of the five district attorneys. They are our partners to catch professional deed fraud rings that usually include lawyers and banks. What can people do to protect their properties? We need everyone's involvement, including the public's cooperation, to prevent deed fraud. Here are some measures the public can take to protect themselves. Review your property records annually for activity. This information is available on our website through the Automated City Register Information System, commonly referred to as ACRIS, where you can view property records. And that's at http www.nyc.gov slash site slash finance slash taxes slash ACRIS page. <laughs> Register your property with the city registers office. We have a program called Notice of Recorded Document. Once you register, you will be notified by text or by email where there is activity on your property. It's free and you can register online, same site with the deed fraud program page as the extension. Check with your Department of Finance if you stop receiving property tax and water bills or if any of your utility bills suddenly increase. If you own a property in New York City that's not occupied, we recommend that you check it often to make sure it is not illegally occupied. If you're going away for a long period of time, ask someone you trust to check on your house regularly while you're gone. Have them collect your mail so it does not pile up, a signal that the house is unoccupied. Be very careful of people or organizations that offer you cash to help you with loan modifications or foreclosure prevention. This is very important. This is one of probably the most key things you should be looking at. Never turn over your deed or transfer ownership of your home to a mortgage assistance company. Do not sign any property related documents that you do not understand. We encourage people to first consult with a trusted attorney before signing papers. Do not hire a lawyer referred to you by someone who might have a vested interest in your property, such as a realtor. From our investigations, perpetrators of deed fraud operate like a gang. They have their own attorneys, mortgage bankers, notaries, title companies, and real estate brokers. Use a title company that you have vetted for real estate transactions and make sure your title insurance has deed fraud protection. One of the ways people can help count of activity, keep count of activity taking place with their properties is through the, registering with the New York City Department of Finance's Notice of Recorded Document, also known as the NRD program. Currently, roughly 45% of registrations are by city government offices. However, we've provided a breakdown of participants not affiliated with city government. 
Intro 1673. The city supports this legislation to require DOF to establish and maintain a system that would allow individuals to register to receive notifications by email or text message whenever any document affecting an ownership interest in real property is recorded with the city register or the office of the Richmond County Clerk. DOF will be able to provide quarterly reports on the utilization of the system, including the number of registrants, the number of individuals contacting DOF regarding suspected fraudulent recording. However, the city has two concerns. The first, the reporting requirement of information about referrals made to the city sheriff related to sus suspect fraudulent recordings, and two, reporting requirements for the Richmond County Clerk. The city is concerned that providing detailed information about a case too early in the process may jeopardize an ongoing criminal investigation. Instead, the city suggests a friendly amendment to provide numbers of cases aggregated by each county office that are referred for investigation. Additionally, the city is concerned about reporting on the Richmond County Clerk as they maintain their own systems. Instead, the city suggests requesting the Richmond County Clerk to provide DOF on a quarterly basis the same data. In doing so, DOF will be able to deliver one report quarterly representing all five boroughs. Finally, we would like to know if there is a preference on the reporting based on a fiscal year or calendar year. We are hopeful we can work with Council to resolve what we see as two issues to implementation. We would now like to take the opportunity to remind people what they can do if they suspect they are a victim of deed fraud. First, act quickly. Do not be embarrassed or wait to get help. The more time that passes, the more difficult it may be to regain legal title because of how quickly the property can be transferred, perhaps multiple times. File a complaint with the New York City Sheriff's Office. Please call 718-707-2100. That's easy. It's important that they open a criminal investigation. Hire an attorney to help you regain legal title to your property. Check to see if your title insurance policy covers deed fraud. This could help cover the costs associated with hiring an attorney. If you can't afford one, contact the New York State Attorney General's office. They will work with partners to provide free assistance to homeowners throughout the state. Their website is agscamhelp.com. I hope that this testimony today has given you concrete outline of the measures we have in place to deter and to detect deed, uh, deed fraud. Thank you for your time. I will now take questions. <coughs> Thank you very much for coming to testify, Sheriff. I must say that you have been a great partner through this process, um, so I'm happy that you're on top of things. Of course, we want to figure out how many ways we can help um, strengthen your part of the agency, but also um, from a legislative angle, how we can codify a lot of this so it can go beyond our tenure. Um, now, I wanted to ask, and I, I'm sure Councilmember <coughs> Rosenthal will follow up, but when you said that 45% of those that are registered are city-owned properties, does that mean that the remain? I, I don't know, I, I'm trying to understand why highlight the, 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 um, city-owned properties as opposed to the property owners? Like, what was the highlight there? I'm going to defer to the city register. She handles the recording. Oh, okay. <laughs> there you go. Can you just state your full name for the record? Annette Hill. M. Hill, City Register Assistant Commissioner. Excellent. Um, agencies such as HPD who might have an interest in a property or DCAS who has own city property, will register to keep track of city-owned property to see if any action has happened on the property. So that's what we mean as 45%. It's so most, it's a lot of HPD properties. They do register because they have an interest in the property. So I guess what I'm trying to get at, while I appreciate that number, how many of New York City's properties can you, can you say are not registered? Well, considering we have one point over a million properties, 
Um, I don't have the breakdown of, of the individual properties with me. I could get that to you. If you can but, get it for the but, committee. Yeah, but we do have it. What we have, what we gave you is number by registrant, how many people have actually registered for. Um, so out of approximately a million, and I want to make sure I'm reading this right. Out of approximately a million properties, we have 49,000 registered? Yeah, and they could be for multiple properties or one property. I would have to get your breakdown. Okay, so I want a breakdown of who has multiple properties under a register. Is it one registrant and multiple properties? Or help us understand what that's about. Obviously, you know, this is a very big problem if there's only 49,300 properties registered and there's a million properties that are, you know, let's say a million properties that are still vulnerable. Um, so we need to get better at that aspect of why is it that people don't know that this is something they can do? Is it the outreach? Um, I know that your, your part of the agency could be limited in resources, but you have an incredible mouthpiece here, 51 members that can help um, but we need to understand this process. So that's why we do these oversights hearings and, and, do, um, and, and, and then follow up with legislation. So I just wanted to ask, I'm going to go back to the, to the sheriff, and then I'm going to come back to you, and we're going to hear from Council Member uh, Rosenthal, followed by Council Member Vallone, followed by Council Member Cornegie. We've been joined by Council Member Rodriguez, who stepped out, and Minority Leader Mario. Um, according to the documents provided to the council, the budgeting headcount for fiscal 2018 for the office of the sheriff was 188 people, up from 178 in fiscal 17. What is the actual headcount, and is it above 188? 188, 188, and when do you anticipate full, um, fully, uh, fully budgeted headcount? We're approximately 120 deputy sheriffs and about 18 investigators. Now, what we've been dealing with is we do, do not have a <clears throat> certified deputy sheriff list. The exam was given in February. It's probably very close to being certified. And once it's certified, we can then start hiring off that list. So we're basically waiting for a, a list to be certified so that we can onboard deputy sheriffs and investigators. That process takes uh, if we're being very expedient, which we generally are, about three months to vet someone and then approximately seven months to train them. So we're not looking at having a full staff until sometime next year. Okay. And just for clarity, all, once you ramp up to your 188 and, you know, and maybe the next council session after we see more movement, may push, have a push to increase your agency for support. But can you um, help us understand what else the sheriff's office does? It's, you're, you don't have 188 people working on deed fraud. No, we have six people, but we also have the resources available to pull more. Okay. So the, the, the sheriff's office is a very small law enforcement agency. The best analogy I could give is if the, the police department is the Army, the sheriff is the Marine Corps. We're a very small group, we're very mobile, and we focus on general problems. Our primary role is to enforce court orders. So we carry out the execution of arrest warrants, orders of protection, and all variety of court orders that are issued in the city. We get approximately 53,000 of them a year. So we're very, very busy as far as enforcing court orders. So on one hand, the sheriff's role is to enforce court orders. We also have a criminal investigative component. The criminal investigative component is handled by our Bureau of Criminal Investigation. That portfolio is eclectic, I guess is the best way to describe it. We handle cigarette tax, so we, we handle the enforcement of most of the tobacco legislation that has been passed by the council in the last several years has fallen onto the sheriff's office to, to, to take on, so we handle that. We handle the investigation of deed fraud. Uh, we also were mandated by the state to do background investigation for volunteer firefighters, and many people are unaware there are volunteer firefighter companies in New York City. And there are also small uh, segments of the law that require the sheriff to conduct criminal investigations if asked, such as voter fraud and fraud against the elective franchise. So the sheriff is an officer that can be called upon to do many different types of investigations, but our primary investigations for our BCI consist of tobacco and deed fraud. And then you also, because I know that you have a role in 
um, fraud, like for parking tickets, we had yes. discussed that. So where does that fall in? Uh, we, we have a small but growing industry in parking fraud. So we have an investigator assigned to parking fraud. Now, the way the office handles its responsibilities, we have people that are primarily assigned to the investigations, but then we can draw upon the needs of the office if we have to do something large scale. So if we're going to have a series of arrests, we draw upon the entire resources of the office to conduct the arrests. So we have people assigned, and then we have a greater amount of people that we have that have more flexibility in their assignment that can be called upon to assist. And do you think at 188 that is a satisfactory number of staff, or could you use more? At this point in time, the commissioner and I are discussing what the needs of the sheriff's office are, because they're growing depending on the legislative changes that are put forward. The 188 represents what we need in order to meet our current goals. As goals and more duties are added to the sheriff's office, depending on those types of duties, we may need more additional resources. And what's the difference between a deputy sheriff and an investigator? <clears throat> the deputy sheriff is the, I would say, the jack-of-all-trades law enforcement officer. The deputy sheriff can do almost any task. They can be assigned to make an arrest. They can be assigned to conduct an investigation. They're the only officer that's authorized to execute civil process. So they're the omni officer for the sheriff's office. Okay. The investigator is very narrowly tailored to do fraud investigations. They do certain investigations related to tobacco. They do certain investigations related to deed fraud. And they do certain investigations related to fraud. But they work in tandem with the deputy sheriff. Uh, their salary range is slightly less than the deputy sheriff. Uh, and their career path is s smaller within our agency, but greater within the entire fraud investigator group in the city. Okay. Um, and, and why I ask this and why I want to put it on the record is if you ask anyone whose home has been stolen, they will probably respond and say that we haven't done enough as a city, right? Um, do we need more investigators? Did we need more sheriff? Do you need more support? So as you go and have these discussions with your commissioner, I'm hoping that you can keep some of the narrative and that someone from your office can stay behind and listen to some of the advocates and people who have gone through this process. And I know that you've engaged in a lot of conversations, um, but it would be great if someone can just stay behind to hear. Absolutely, that's not a problem. Okay. Um, would DOF, um, and I guess this can fall on either one of you, um, ever consider making the notice of recorded document program an opt-out program rather than an opt-in program? And why haven't you done this already? I'm going to defer to the register. You, what you, I just want to clarify, I mean, opt-out meaning they have to do it or they do not have to do it? I just want to make that sure they have to do, do it. They have to do it. Um, we haven't really discussed it, but they do. Ha we do once we um, record a document after it's been the transfer. We do send you a letter telling you it's it's recommended that you do it, and we give you the, sure. the process of doing it. But we haven't considered making it mandatory. So I think people are like texting right now mm -hmm. to make an LS request <laughs> mm -hmm. to make this mandatory. Okay. especially with the egregious number of 49,000 properties versus a million properties. Right. Um, so if, you know, when you get back to your office, I think this is a conversation that, a broader conversation that needs to be had because either you do it by policy or we're going to legislate it right. um, because the number is so varied and almost, are, you know, are we not doing the best that we can um, to protect property owners, and I feel like this might be the space where we we can we can have as many reporting documents, we can do as much charts and all this stuff. But if in reality it's the first step that we're missing, there's nothing that happens in step two, three, and four if we can't get to the first step. Um, who created the notice of recorded document system? Um, internal IT or a consultant, and how much did it cost to create, if you happen to have that? I don't have the figures what it costs, but it was all done internally. Internally? Yes. And it's managed internally? And it's managed internally. So if, you know, because there's every New Yorker that owns a property um, is watching this hearing right now, and they were to register right now, we, can, we have the capacity to handle registering an uptick in property? Yeah, it's a registration is done online, and... Um, 
we, we only have to send a notice if something transpires on the property. So even if there's over a million properties, it's the reality that there's something being transferred every day on your property is very small. Right. So, um, but capacity, I'm saying, right now your system is taking oversight of about 49,000 properties. If we get to this opt-in project that you would have to do, does the system currently have the capacity, and you might not be ready to answer this question, to be able to register a million properties? I would have to check with IT, but I, I would have to say yes, based because out of um, the responses we give, about 90% 90, 90 is done by emails. So it's not a physical, we have to send the mail. And it's okay, all the I just email. want you to have, um, we're going to follow up a question because I do think you have to circle back with IT. Absolutely. We have had very daunting processes just to change the smallest thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm concerned about capacity um, once we are able to change this into an opt in, um, uh, an opt out, an opt out, sorry, <laughs> an opt out process. Um, I have a couple of other questions, but I do want to give my colleagues an opportunity to ask theirs, and I'll circle back. Um, so we'll hear from Council Member Rosenthal, followed by Council Member Vallone. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Ferris Copeland, and thank you for all your hard work. Um, I just want to, I'm, I'm trying to compare some of the information that the Commissioner gave a few months ago compared to where we are today. Um, so I just want to double check some of the data. On pay, at the top of page two, you say since July 2014, when we increased our focus on the issue, more than 1,973 cases have been referred to the Sheriff's Office. So it's since July 14 until when? So we repaired this report, which was three weeks ago. So it's fair to say October 17 or end of sep September? Yes. Okay. Um, what's interesting to me is that as of from July 14 to February 16, which was the original uh, at the hearing, was the data that the commissioner reported on, there had been 1,100 cases referred to your office, and then now adding on another year and a half, there's an additional 800 cases. Um, do you think that the number referred to your office has increased over the last year or two, or they, they've remained steady in the sense that we, okay. we were estimating about 1,000 a year, even though it's one year is 1,200, one year it's 800. <clears throat> what we see is that the message is getting out. We try to record what methodology the person came to us under. Did they, were they referred to by the district attorney's office? Did they receive a notification from the Department of Finance? So we do ask people how did they find out, you know, what, what, what made them wake up and come to our office, because that's part of the investigative process. Um, <clears throat> what we see, though, and I, I, I'm sure you'll ask this question, is a lot of people that believe that they're the subject to deed fraud, they may have been defrauded, but it may not rise to the level of a criminal fraud. Right. And I'll get into more details if you want. But we, we do have a lot of disputes between family members where they're, they're fighting over property, which is a large volume. A lot of people do make these allegations against one another. And then we also have, unfortunately, the situations where the person was not savvy enough to understand the business deal that they were involved in, and they signed over the property. And while no crime occurred, it really is a tragedy. So that explains the difference between the number of cases referred to your office and the number of cases pursued criminally. Correct. And we also have, we have people coming forward making complaints. When we started our investigation, people came forward and made complaints, but unfortunately the statute of limitations had already expired. It's very, we have a small period of time, about four years at, at the maximum, to act on these cases. So if somebody sits on a matter for more than four years, the statute of limitations for a criminal case has elapsed. So um, it sounds like you guys started the notice of recorded documents 
um, about <coughs> two years ago. Um, how, uh, how many people have signed up? Actually, the notice of recorded documents started in um, 2011. In 2011? It was, um, implement, it was implemented like July of 2010, but it was full force in 2011. Um, as of this morning, when I looked at the last numbers, there was 91,000 registered to um, receive notification. 91,000 registered. How many people walked in the door and chose not to register, do you think? I, don't, I would not be able to give you that number. I'm sorry. Because no. people do it online and they um, choose. I can't tell you which, who walked in and chose not to do it. Okay, great. Um, but you could automatically do it at the time. You, you, could, you could do it at any time. You don't have to wait for something to be recorded. You could go online at any time and register to receive notification. Okay. Um, for those who have signed up, how do you think they heard about it? Um, we do quite a bit of outreach um, with, when we started, and we continue doing outreach. In the beginning, we, we, we've sent notices with our mailings. It's, this, it's on our website. Um, when you go in to record a document, it's right there. When we've asked people, a lot of them have told us because when they recorded something at the point, a letter was received from us, or they've gone into the sheriff's office, and the sheriff has encouraged them through um, information. So that's, that's usually how people do word of mouth or from our website. And so um, you, sent, you sent, it sounds like DOF has sent out one uh, notice about this on property tax form, is that it? Or? We have done quite a bit since the beginning. We've sent it, we have put notices in our billing statement and when the program first started um, to notify people about this. We have flyers that we sent out also from the city registers office. We have put notices with all our recordings to let them know this is available. It's, been, it's on our website. We've also changed and added it to uh, the ACRA system. So if someone goes in to check on their property, and it comes up automatically telling you that this is available and you could register. Is it uh, systematic now that every year, like once a year on the billing, it's in, that language is included? In the property it's not tax systematic, bill? no. Okay. Please. Um, thank you, um, Council Member. So, is this, in t I just want it for clarity, in six years, we've been able to register 91,000 properties? We've had 91 registrations, yes. In six years? In six years. With a million properties out there? Uh, no, thank you. Um, and actually, it'd be interesting to see the trend on that. If you could see the numbers registered every year, is that possible? OK. Um, so what would happen, how many people uh, what happens after they sign up and they get a notice of a filing that they don't recognize? What happens then? After they've signed up and they receive a, a note, after they've signed up, if something transpires and it has an interest in their property, they'll get a letter from a seller and <coughs> this has happened. In the notice, it tells them if you know about this, then you, you do nothing because you know of the transaction. However, if you have a question about the notice, go online, look at the um, ACRA system, contact the sheriff's office immediately, or come into one of our offices, the, the, uh, the city register office, for additional information. Um, so how many times do you think um, you've sent that letter out? So in other words, of the 91,000 who have registered something since we've started doing the automatic notification once um, a document's been recorded, every, we record over, for deed transfers, over 90,000 documents a year, give or take. So I would say it goes on at least 90,000 times a year with each recording. Over 9,000 times? 90,000 documents, deed recordings a year. So each, for each deed recording that goes out, the letter goes out telling them if there's been a transfer and you could now register if you're not aware of it. So I'll say about 90, that's an sure. automatic notification. So now let's say somebody's registered. Mm -hmm. 
How many times has it happened that a letter has gone to them saying there's been a property transfer? In other it, words, it, the re by registering, it triggers something, right? It, yeah, it it only, it, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. It, it, you'll only get a notification if, if another something else is registered against your property. How many times has that happened? I would have to look and see for each property how often something has trans transferred on that particular property. I can't tell you. I don't need to know by property. I just want to know in total. I don't have those figures available to me how many times we've sent it for each property that has been registered on a property. I don't have that in front of me. Yeah. I'm, I'm just wondering if the system asking. works, mm -hmm. and then when it works, how many of the letters that's been sent out how many people have then contacted the sheriff's office to say, ooh, I got a letter some, saying something's going on with my property. No, I haven't done anything. So what's going on here? Let's figure it out. We don't keep track of it. I don't have those figures. What we do look at is we have increased numbers of call-ins based upon the mailing that they received. And a lot of times we're able to dismiss the complaint very early on. That's where our complaint dismissal rate is, is, is high because somebody calls up because they did a re refinance. Because that transaction affects their real property, it triggers the notification. And so ex you're, you're on the line. So exactly what I'm trying to figure out is how many times is it something straightforward like that? How many times is it not straightforward? In fact, something- We haven't collected data on that in the sheriff's untoward office. Untoward has happened. So you don't know about the success of the program? No. No, I can't tell you how many times that complaint triggered something that was going to be something larger. Many times the trigger for the program is simply that property, there was a refinance, they're notified of it, or what we have had is people who are part owners of a piece of property. So you and I own a piece of property together. And then I, the, one of the partners sell their interest. Because you have an interest in the property, you would get noticed. It's not a fraudulent transaction, it's legitimate, but because the notice is triggered based upon any effect of your real property, you'll receive the notice on it. Okay. It, it strikes me that it would be worth knowing the success of what your program is. It makes common sense, sort of obvious, that it would be important, I don't know, Okay, um, so if someone has been victimized by a fraudulent deed filing, so now it's, it's a criminal situation, um, what services does DOF or the city offer to that person? Well, we have a criminal investigation, which will conclude if we make an arrest and, 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 and refer the matter to the district attorney's office. We do the follow-up trial investigation for the DA if any of the evidence is needed while the, the trial is going on, if the DA needs a witness or, that, or something else develops during the trial that the DA would like to know, that matters referred to the sheriff's office. The actual getting the property back into a person's hands isn't in the role of the sheriff in this format. There is a method, but it's more ministerial in nature, and I don't have any, I'm not involved in the mechanics of it, I'm involved in the conclusion of it. How many um, cases have you, how many cases have you brought where you've said something fraudulent is going on? We've made 37 arrests where we were right. able to prove that there was a criminal right. activity in the transfer. So the completed cases with the DA was 96 and the arrest was 37 or the property is 54. Mm -hmm. Let's assume that the important numbers to look at are sort of completed cases, 96, minus 54. What happens to the other 40 people, 40 properties? You're, you're, you're mixing apples and oranges. Okay. The number of cases and the number of people arrested and the number of the properties, they're all permutations. They're not one for one for okay. one for one. Because we arrest How one person. How many don't succeed so that somebody never gets their property back? The issue is even if we conduct a criminal investigation, the person may never get their property back. That's why it's not a piece of data that we actually track. Our role is to show that there's probable cause and build the criminal case. Once we have done that, 
we have no mechanism to get the property back into the person's hands. The mechanism to get the property back into the person's hands is for the person to go to court. I got you. Yeah. So you never hear back from the DA's office whether or not something has gone back into the person's hands? We do if it's part of the plea bargain. We had a particular case where one party, instead of in lieu of going to jail, was willing to transfer the property back to the victim. But that was two pieces of property, and it was involving one arrest that we made. And that's a small percentage. So two were plea bargains, so you know it went back. And the, all the rest you don't know. What boroughs were those in? Brooklyn. Oh, feel free. Brooklyn. So for, of the 96, we don't know about 94. Correct. Again, th we don't keep data on if the person gets their property back or not. Can you hypothetically, as DOF, couldn't you know, couldn't you do a run today that we sent over 96 cases and uh, in those cases, XYZ person was listed as the property owner and then do a run today to see who was listed as the property owner? Are you, are you asking us to do this? I would think you'd want to know well, whether or not it went back into the hands the, of the- The mindset of the sheriff's office is very, very clear. We're ministerial in nature, meaning that we carry out the exact measure of the law that we're supposed to, and we act within the, the parameters of the law. We generally don't go beyond our role because our resources are very small. The New York City Police Department is 30,000, New York City Sheriff's Office, 188. So yeah. our, our role is to carry I mean, out the mandate. I guess my point and my disappointment, I'm sorry, I'm looking a little bereft, um, is, is it's another example of the city thinking in their silos, you know, agency silos, versus from the residents' point of view of, you know, across all agencies. It has nothing to do with what you're doing. You're doing an amazing job. Mm -hmm. I appreciate all the work you do. Um, for seniors who can't sign up on the internet, um, do they have other ways of signing up? Yeah, there is a paper form that they could mail in. Uh, or if they happen to walk into an office, they could um, be assisted. Okay. Is there any reason somebody wouldn't want to be getting this information? Like, is something annoying to get the information? Like, why not make it an opt-out system? Um, I can't speak for what a person would want or want to do, but I will let you know we've had some people who've been annoyed that we actually sent a notice telling them something transpired. So not everybody likes to receive, you know, paper and end this notification. But um, I can say as to why, you know, if they would not want to get it. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. And I guess those would be the people that opt out, right? If you're annoyed of getting paper. Um, but if you don't know, anyway. Um, so I just wanted to follow up and just for clarity, because this committee in particular, and I'm sure also in, in aging committees, um, and the senior centers um, subcommittee, you can have an opportunity to speak to the district attorneys. I am, and I know this has nothing to do with you, you don't even have to respond, but I think it is incredibly daunting and I, I don't even have a word to express that you can plea bargain to give someone their house back for no time. Like, you committed a crime, you stole my house, and the big plea deal is, oh, please get out, and then we're okay. And I, I, I'm not saying I know what your role is, I know you just show this is a case to investigate, but I gotta tell you how frustrating it is from our end, because we have to give constituents a response, and it's horrible that that's where we are. And I know we've come a long way, because I think that in many cases, we weren't even seeing these cases really brought up, or there wasn't enough investigative work, so I applaud you for your collection angle of it, right? Because you want to put the best, give them the best tools and the best case. Um, but I do believe um, as committee members, uh, even beyond January when I'm not here, that you could remember to, pre to put some questions and pressure on the DAs um, because I think that that is not fair. That part of the deal is that you get to leave the property and then you don't do any time. I don't know, that's just, me kind of being boisterous. Councilmember Vallone, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, 
Sheriff Facino and Commissioner, thank you very much. Your knowledge makes this hearing uh, uh, that much better, so we're getting the exact answers that we need. Um, I don't think the, I think we have two two-step process. One is creating a new and better process to protect owners who are unaware, because clearly based on the testimony, those who are aware and are part of these programs voluntarily are the ones that are usually protected. So our goal is to now create a system for those who aren't voluntarily participating in the NRD program or any other program to then get some type of trigger notice, not the traditional notice, because I do get a lot of homeowners are upset with all the different mail, but if they were to get a notice saying, hey, a deed has been filed, did you consent to this? I don't think they'd get upset over that one. So I think our, our goal is to create a new system in place to protect existing homeowners so that we protect the most vulnerable, like you were saying. And then, Sheriff, I'm interested in, it seemed like you had some testimony as to the protection and the handing off to the district attorney as to ways we can either increase fines or look at criminal existing statutes to tighten them up. Um, so let me, let me start with the first one. Would, would there be opposition to requiring and mandating the NRD be provided at notice at a closing to a homeowner or that the Department of Finance provide a homeowner document of owner's rights at uh, any type of transfer so that they could mandatorily be part of this process, especially the notice of recording? I would have to talk to the commissioner about the IT component and obviously the cost, but the commissioner is always willing to listen to issues that help the community. Yeah, because I'll give you a similar scenario. We had a hearing on mandating restrictive covenants, and the same problem came up as homeowners weren't aware that there was a restrictive covenant. So we were trying to think, well, how can we make them aware? And uh, Department of Finance came up with a great new recording on the time of Acris, a box that says, is there a restrictive covenant on the property? But the problem is title companies aren't requiring it. So that's a separate issue. So I'm looking at creating a mandate that must be followed upon the transfer of property and then a subsequent way. So I think a statute requiring that you must be part of the program and with some type of opt-out provision, if you can, would be a great step. I think that would be a good one. Um, and then, Sheriff, you had mentioned the statute of limitations. Like, my head's abuzz with different legislation ideas. and <laughs> This is what happens when you have a lawyer on it. So I'm thinking, similar to other more egregious matters, that we ask Albany to stay the statute of limitations. On, it doesn't start until notice is, is received by the land owner that some type of fraud may have occurred. To so hold against them a statute of limitations that they didn't know exists is certainly not fair to any homeowner because they didn't know the fraud occurred on their house until either you come knocking or someone tells them, hey, there's a foreclosure. I, I agree with you. I think the complexity will be how to narrow it down to the specific field because we don't charge a person with deed fraud. We charge them with various levels of larceny. We charge them with uh, filing false instruments. So this, the, when, when we successfully prosecute, when the district attorney successfully prosecutes someone, it's, it's you know, the, the caption is it's for deed fraud, but then that's, that's not what they're convicted of. They're convicted of other offenses, and those offenses usually capture more than just deed fraud. Larceny obviously captures all different types of theft. Grand larceny captures all different so there's types. there's no existing criminal statute specifically Correct. for deed fraud? There's well, no, that's a problem. There's that's a no problem. specific deed fraud related crime. It's grand larceny for obviously the property value. And then there's all the various um, filing of false instruments with the government agency. So if the documents that you filed were fraudulent, we charge you. There are perjury charges. Could I ask for your assistance in providing what those existing larcenies and crimes are that are Yeah, the general penal law, I would, we'd have to go through it on the different charges, but they're just the various penal law charges of the grand larceny that, that are dependent on the property value. Dep over a certain amount of money, it's a, a certain level of grand larceny. I would think probably most, most properties in the city trigger grand larceny because of the level. Yeah, absolutely. Most, tri most real properties do, but then there are different levels of grand larceny depending on how, how high a value the property is worth. So do you think there's room there to tighten up or expand what those there's, fines and criminal statutes are? Th there's always room to modify the law, but again, it relies on Albany to change these, th these laws to add these certain provisions in. Because well, this is, we can, we can very start the process. To this issue. We can start the process with misdemeanors, but when it comes to felonies and heart larger, well, then we'd have to go to Albany. Right. So Correct. we could probably take a two-step process yeah. on that. Um, so I'd like to, to follow up with that. I think that'd be important Certainly. On, on those. How many cases 
Do, did you, there was a 96 and a 37 going back and forth, but you had said some, some of them didn't reach the level. Excuse and that's me? what, you said some of them didn't reach the level of triggering the fraud investigation. And Correct. That, that got my ears also. So how many do come into your unit in total besides the ones we, that you actually- we, we took in 1,973 cases and 1,119, we were not able to show some level of criminal activity or the statute of limitations has expired. We were not able to bring it to an arrest. We were not able to show that there was criminal activity. All right, those are two big differences, though, yes. statute of limitations versus meeting the limit, the, limit, uh, the, the requirement of criminal. Right. Do you have the difference between those? If you were to eliminate statute of limitations. I, I don't have that figure because early on in the process, we look at the statute of limitations. So if somebody comes in and says, you know. Did you get that subsequent data? I think that would be important for us. If we can I believe we statu- can, we'd, we'd have to do a little digging to get it. If this is something important, we'll dig and look and see how many that we were able to say. But we never make a conclusive finding that there is no fraud because somebody may want to bring a civil action against the party. And we don't want to damage their ability to try to recover the property. So our position has always been, if we can prove criminal intent, we bring it to the district attorney. If we're unable to prove criminal intent, we remain silent. Well, that's why I think your two friendly amendments were right on point. Mm -hmm. I think there's a place where we don't want to get involved. So if there's a separate civil action, uh, Richmond County has a separate recording process. I think that's important. So I don't think we'd have any opposition to the amendments. Um, Commissioner, I saw you you stepped up. Did you want to add in on any of? Oh, hi. I'm Sheila Feinberg at the Department of Finance. I guess I just wanted to uh, clarify a few things that have come up in this hearing. And one was this number of the million properties. And it's true, DOF assesses over a million properties. But where we see the cases of deed fraud occurring are in class one properties, single family homes, and mostly in predominantly gentrifying neighborhoods. So I just wanted to give a little bit more context to those numbers that were discussed earlier. Can you, class one, how many are we at? I knew you were going to ask me that, and I don't have that number for you. But you I should have Googled it, it. I know, I should have Googled it, but I um, Can but you wait. just give us, I, I won't hold you to, but a guesstimation? I would say, I'm looking at a net, what would you say? I would say about 300. Yeah, about 300,000. 300,000. Yeah. 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 You see, so those numbers sound a little bit better. I don't love them, but I know you don't love them, but I wanted to give you a little bit more context to that. Okay, so about 300,000 properties, and we have about 91,000. So maybe about a third are registered in our program right now. Okay, still not great, but better. (laughs) All right. Well, that's that's why Queens, you know, where my district in Northeast Queens is all single family. It's, it's one of the prevalent topics, especially with my seniors, um, as to the fraud committed upon them because they owned the property for such a long period of time. A husband or wife may have died, and the surviving spouse is completely unaware of the deed that's existing or what their rights are. And then the, the next case is the kids who inherit or the grandkids inherit have no idea the percentage ownership that each one has, what their rights are, or if one decides to unscrupulously try to sell it or transfer without their knowledge. Those are the two main things we're trying to prevent and or assist, in my estimation. And I would just add to that, I mean, we do, we do hear those cases about the heirs disputing the rights to properties. Um, and the other thing I, w- I wanted to add is that we, the Department of Finance has a very robust outreach team, and we are happy to go to council districts. We're happy to come to you to talk about our defraud program, the work that we are doing. We have a brochure that we are also revamping. Um, I know that we did a town hall with Councilmember Carnegie, and we're happy to do another town hall. Is there any requirement upon a notice of a death of a homeowner on the Department of Finance to, to send a notice to the surviving owners? Not currently. That I'm I think that's going to be a subsequent bill. Also. I think that would help. I think once a death certificate, a notice of death is uh, received by the city, uh, a notice should go out to the surviving owners that Uncle Smith, you know, it wouldn't be your responsibility to other than just notifying the, the remaining homeowners that one of the owners had passed. Yeah, there's no requirement. DOF does not do that, and we don't always have information of the death of a um, registered owner right away. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your help to us. Thank you. Um, actually, uh, Councilmember Rosenthal had a question, and it was about have any Class two properties ever, or any other of the other classes, seen deed fraud? Or is it just in class one? Pretty sure. I believe we had, 
we'd have to go back and check. We have every piece of property. I don't want to say that we had one or we had two and we right. had more than that, but we do have the numbers of properties, their addresses, and we could easily check what category of property. That. Thank you. That's easy. Can you just, let's have Councilmember Cornegie do, and then we can circle back on our second round. Councilmember Cornegie. Thank you, and, but to answer your question, in my district alone, we've had several mixed-use properties that were under the fraud. Actually, we have one very, very prominent case right now happening. So I want to start by saying thank you. No, I, I don't no. know that. I'm just saying in my district. So, and, and, and um, I feel kind of uniquely qualified to be in this conversation because, as you all know, that like my district is um, the epicenter of gentrification and seemingly the epicenter for uh, deed theft and deed fraud. Um, I want to thank uh, this entire panel because I've worked uh, uh, with you uh, significantly. Um, I do want to give a special shout out actually to, um, uh, to our AG who's committed um, $6 million to deed theft and deed fraud, not just for my district, which I had hoped it would be, is for actually the entire state. Uh, so um, it's a concerted effort that has taken place. So in particular, you know, uh, Sheriff Fischillo, your office, and um, if I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, Detective Sergeant, Sergeant Russo. Russo. <laughs> no, the, please tell I didn't, I made that mistake. Um, and, and Trano for on the ground working diligently to try to eradicate some of this going off. I want to give also a special shout out to finance who um, has worked diligently to pull or to flag um, short sales and quick claim deeds to check the validity of that because that was one of the things that was happening in my district. There were these short sales that kept coming up and that was a trigger. And so, actually, I want to really thank the Department of Finance for using that as a trigger and being able to do some investigation. Um, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of great things happening with the agencies in, in, in front of us. And I just want to say, as a council member and as the city council, wait, I want to know what we can do more. Um, and sometimes it's resource. I haven't heard that mentioned today. Sometimes it's more staffing. Sometimes it's not. There are other ways to get at this. Um, you know, you guys coming out and doing a town hall, a aforementioned town hall in my district, raised awareness in my community and began, I know that there's an uptick in, in our ACRIS registrations, right? I'm just saying it anecdotally, but people were so pleased with the information that they were given um, that a lot of people, including my family, went and registered with ACRIS. So uh, I just, I, first of all, I, you know, I don't have a question. I just want to thank you guys uh, for the work that you've done. Thank you for being here at the hearing. I want to thank the, um, the chair and my colleagues for putting in legislation uh, like this, it's going to take a collaborative effort to begin to stem the tide in this particular climate that we're in. So thank you for your work. I look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Rosenthal, I know you wanted to follow up. Sorry. I didn't mean to be so burning there on the question. But um, it would be interesting to know the number of uh, times this has happened with other class properties. Um, there was the famous Daily News uh, stealing of the deed where they owned Empire State Building for a short while um, just to sort of demonstrate how easy it was to do this. Um, I think it took them 90 minutes. So uh, I think it's important to know this stuff, a mix, you know, and to the extent that you can separate it out by commercial buildings, mixed-use mis mix buildings, um, multiple dwelling buildings, you know, I think that would be really helpful. Part of the reason we're asking is because I would wonder if there's a different mechanism for how those cases are pursued um, structurally compared to class one property. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, in the recent mayor's management report, it notes that the average time to record and index property documents has been reduced by over two days, from three and a half days to about one day. Um, between fiscal 2016 and 17, and according to the MMR, DOF has retrained staff to enable quicker review of the documents. Now, I know that that's something that, um, if you look at it from timeliness and making sure that we process and there's no delay, um, is a good thing. 
but do we have any issues and concern or have you trained the staff in a way that we're not aggressively processing these documents and in that because we're going so fast missing something okay. part of that a uh, part of that um, retraining was actually creating a group within the city register just to look at documents that are flagged we've also put um, in our system, we've put mechanisms to flag certain types of documents, such as somebody who's a repeat, who we've had people who've come in um, and have tried to submit a document which the sheriff is aware about. So we've, we have that as a flag in the system. That comes up, the system actually flags it to the examiner so it doesn't go through the process. We've made a, we've made a list of um, ongoing issues that we've seen, with, such as um, quick claim deeds, the system will flag that. So the review process has been quicker, um, but we also have mechanisms in the system that alerts the um, reviewer not to go further and move that out of the review into the special unit to do the um, review and then refer to the sheriff if needed. So all the cases that are flagged mm -hmm. within this one day, right, within your window, are then sent to another process within your department? Right, if a, if a unit, if a, if a, unit um, a recording is flagged that it needs additional review, it is removed from the whole recording system. I have, a, I have staff that will go in and do the legwork to check the chain, look at the recordings, look at the name, and we'll send that package for further review over to the sheriff where he will start looking at for other things within it. So. And then just to correlate in these numbers, how many cases are flagged, let's say a month, or how many cases have you flagged since you've implemented this new? Because then the cases that are flagged should be reflected in some number at the sheriff's office, right? Our reports, I don't have them here, but we have a report, how many referred from the city register, how many were walk-ins, how many came from the various district attorneys and other sources. So we do keep that data. That's so the, you'll share that with us yes, so we can yes. better understand that process. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna, I have some other questions, but they're all very um, technical, and we wanna hear from the advocates and those that have been here for, for um, to give their testimony. Um, so I'm gonna follow up with, the, um, with you in writing. If you can get those back to me, um, I would really appreciate it, because we're gonna be looking at, you know, perhaps amending the current legislation to help reflect some of the things that we found, um, that we've discovered in our hearing today. Um, or, or if we need to create more legislation, or is this policy that can be done internally? Um, you know, what's the fastest way that we can continue to protect and give you all the tools that you need to be able to do and continue the job that you're doing? So um, I, I thank you for your work, and I thank you for coming to testify. You have a lot of things to follow up with me on. Yes. Um, I, I wanted to make a closing, just a quick closing to some of the issues that you brought forward. Sure. <clears throat> so. I know that at times it appears that we're agnostic. It's not. I don't, no, I'm just saying you, you mentioned the silo matter. Uh, you, you did, so it has to be addressed. That's my role. I represent the city, and what you say is important to me. And, I, and, it, and it, it is, it's very important. It may not seem that I'm emotional, because that's my job as sheriff, is to be logical and look at these things. One of the things we try to do is act with precision. We know that there are a lot of criminal activity going on out there, yet we can't prove it, and as an officer of the court, I can't lay that allegation unless I am 100% certain. But we're not fools either. We do collect the data, and it is useful towards our other criminal investigations. But please do not believe in any way, shape, or form that we're siloed. We work with the city register all the time. We work with the five district attorneys. We work with the police department. We work with the council. It is very important for us that the message gets out that we're partners. The sheriff is a partner. We don't go it alone. And that's what I wanted to conclude with. Thank you. Well, that's a good wrap up. Okay. Um, thank you very much. We will, you, like I said before, you have a lot of follow up, a lot of numbers to get back to me. Um, and hopefully we can do that expeditiously. Thank you very much. We're gonna call up our next panel.
Is that fine? Okay. Uh, Jennifer Marin and Marcel Negret. And we were joined by Minority Leader Van Bramer. Majority Leader Van Bramer, please don't tell him that. Thank you I, for I see shaking heads at me. Does that mean I speak now? I've never done this before, so oh, well, please bear with me. Oh, well, welcome to your home. Thank uh, you. And uh, yes, you may begin to testify. Thank you. You don't have anything in writing, right? I don't. Okay, um, that's fine. We'll get it recorded and it'll be transcribed I, for the record. And I can prepare something afterwards and submit it to you as well. That would be uh, great. So if you can just state your name for the record and then you may begin. Yeah, my name is Jennifer Marin. I am the Marin whose family is reflected in the Marin Hirschman Act. I am the victim of a crime in New York City. The crime has completely disrupted my life, turned my situation completely upside down. I am very aware at this point that I am not the sole victim of this crime and that my experience has brought me to the position of representing many others who have suffered a similar situation, victimization actually. When I walked in today, and I've never been in this building before, when I walked in today I noticed on the ceiling over the dais, of the people, by the people, for the people. This is a principle that I have grown up with. I grew up in this country. All of my civics classes and all of my experience led me to believe that that is a principle by which we live. And in this situation, in this room, I am the people. And that's why I feel it's important for me to speak up here and to let you all know what it is that I've experienced and what that has taught me. And I don't want to go on forever. It's a very complex and long discussion, this one. But starting from the outset, my family owned property that it worked very, very hard to earn and pay for. Um, we were the exclusive owners of that property from the time it was built. And as I said, my family, they were not wealthy people. They were hardworking. They were responsible citizens. They came here with next to nothing, like many of our families did, and contributed to this society, to this city, to this country, uh, with their hard work and their effort and their loyalty. And they accumulated generational wealth, which I was the recipient of, until it was all taken from me. Our family property was suddenly removed from my ownership without due cause, without any notification. And it happened because of the registration, the easy registration, I will say, of a fraudulent deed, a deed that was obviously fraudulent, that from the moment I saw it, I could tell, and I'm not trained to do these things, I've never seen any kind of deeds before, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a politician, I'm not a statesperson, I am the people. 
That deed was registered without my knowledge, without any notification to me. I found out about it because the city, while having actually given my property away, or I would say aiding and abetting a criminal act by accepting a fraudulent deed without any inspection whatsoever, the city, at the same time as having taken my property away from me, was charging me taxes and water bills on it. So the city knew that this was my property to the extent that I could be billed by the Department of Finance for taxes and for water and utilities, whilst the Department of Finance also removed the ownership of the property from me. Mm -hmm. I found this out because I got a water bill that was too high, and that prompted me to call the water department where I said, what's going on here? And they pointed out that if it had been a leak, the water use would be flat, and they pointed me to in the direction of the chart that clocked every six hours my water use, and that there was obviously turning on and turning off that was graphed on that chart. And that began the investigation. I called the police. I became uh, a private investigator. I became a, you know, an advocate for myself and eventually an advocate for a lot of other people. Fortunately, I am, I am at age 73 now, still able to think and speak, um, hopefully intelligently and cogently. I know that there are an awful lot of people who are my age and people who are younger than I, who have not had the privilege of education that I've had, who are not able to speak. And I know that there are thousands of cases like mine, thousands of them. I get calls even after, and I, everyone's acknowledged that it was my case and the news that it generated that brought uh, the situation to public awareness and that the city did respond to that uh, by instituting certain um, procedures, and I, I doubt that those procedures, frankly, are effective because I get, on almost a weekly basis, uh, contacted by people who are suffering similar uh, victimization to mine. Um, I, I have a, a question for you. Yes. And I'm sure Council Member Rosenthal will also. Um, I know that you said that you were able to identify that something was going awry because of the water bill, even though you were paying the property taxes. Can you tell us where, where your case stands now, what's, what's happened with the property now? The property is now restored to me. I have spent my entire family savings. In other words, my, my future prior to this was fairly secure. I at age 73, have limited opportunities to earn money. I, was, I had savings. Uh, those were all um, put into uh, getting the house back. I had a long and arduous um, two lawsuits, one required to evict the, the deed, the fraudulent deed holder uh, who was squatting in my house, and the second to have the deed restored to my name. So um, just for I the had record, to, how long did that take you in time, just so we have it on the um, I think it, uh, in the case of the, in, in the lawsuit to evict, um, it took, I think, close to a year. The, the, I don't recall. I can provide you with that information we'll follow up and uh, very easily, and I will do afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, in the uh, restoration of the deed, it took longer, uh, and it was very expensive. It was quite expensive. So in this process, um, what happened with that water bill? What happened to the water bill? I, pay, I, I paid it. I've been paying taxes all along on the property. I was advised by water, 
by gas and by electric that I should not turn off anything or do anything uh, for several reasons. First of all, that would free the uh, guy, his name is Daryl Beatty. He was convicted uh, for one year and got out after eight months, which meant that he actually lived in my house Sorry. for longer than he did in prison, uh, which I find unacceptable. And I think anybody in their right mind would agree to that. Um, it would clear the way for him to establish himself further in the House. Um, I was also told by the attorney who was representing me in the landlord-tenant case to evict that it would also influence the judge, who would then deem that I had been harassing my tenant. There was no tenant. There was no harassment. He had no rights to be there, and yet the system allowed him, through the court, to extend his stay longer and longer and longer. Um, and it turned out, actually, that one of the, that the lawyer who had advised me not to do this, the, the, one, um, the one utility that agreed to shut itself off while not canceling, canceling my account was uh, the gas company, NatGrid. And they came out and they dug up the street and they turned off the gas and they worked with me. Um, Con Ed could not turn off the electricity. I was advised do not cancel your account. Uh, the water department told me also they do not turn off water. Um, they advised me not to cancel the account. So I, w I was paying all of that uh, while Daryl Beatty was living in my house. I have not received any refunds. I've not been restored in any way whatsoever for that. Okay. We are um, jotting down a lot of information. This is actually very helpful to us um, because we can now look at other legislative solutions, um, especially since we do deal with a lot of the uh, utility companies. Um, and, and we're going to be hearing, I'm sure, from the advocates that also have recommendations. Um, so that's why we're all feverishly writing, because your testimony is very, very helpful um, to, to us. I know Councilmember Rosenthal has some additional questions. Um, so, Councilmember Rosenthal. Thank you. Um, Ms. Marin, thank you so much for coming today. The, you, you're right to say you have this additional burden because you're because you brought so much attention, thank you for doing that, to your case, you're asked repeatedly to talk about the situation, you know, to explain what happened to you in order for us to, as legislators, try to make it better. So thank you for your time. I just want to make sure I understood this right. Uh, in order of what you had to do, wouldn't the first thing is you, you had to get the deed turned back into your ownership and then you had to evict after that? Or was it vice versa? Uh, it, it, it started simultaneously. Okay. Um, and I, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know, but there were two separate cases that were handled by two different law firms. The reason I ask is because I'm always curious, and we, we have to balance um, other realities where there are true tenant harassment situations and you don't want to cripple um, the ability of lawyers to stop landlords from doing that. But I'm always curious about why, uh, because someone else, this happened to someone else I know, where the sheriff had, had uh, agreed to change the locks and, and put, you know, yellow tape around the property and say, at the door and say, you know, mm -hmm. the, the squatter cannot go in, but it didn't matter. They went in any way, they found other ways, and similarly, uh, a lawyer told this person, you know, just pay them off instead of having to go through the whole process, what is it about the system? Uh, you know, you're the rightful owner, 
that takes so long, do you think, to evict the person? I, I will respond to that. And the reason that I'm laughing is that I was actually told by a police officer. Same thing. Uh, no, I was told by a police officer who said to me, if you ever point your finger in my direction, I will deny this entirely. But he advised me to get a couple of my big friends to come out and beat this guy up and get him out of my house and just take over again. Of course, this is not my solution. But I mean, I think that, the, that law enforcement, the police, uh, were extremely frustrated by this situation. They understood what was going on. They interrogated Daryl Beatty um, while he was still in the house on several occasions. And the answers that they got were you know, right, left, and all over the place. There was obviously no validity, no truthfulness in them. Um, I think that they and, and the district attorney as well, and I think that the sheriff's uh, testimony here reflects that that, there, that, that there are laws in place that are more effective in, in protecting criminals than in protecting righteous citizens. I have felt that the criminal justice system has been very preferential in its treatment of Daryl Beatty. Um, the, the, just, I mean, the, the case, uh, of, of, of Nat Grid, um, I'm sorry, I'm just, um, it's a lot, was, was, because they turned off the gas and because Daryl Beatty went to them and tried to turn it on again and use the fraudulent deed, it was the one piece of concrete evidence yeah. that could not be escaped. I mean, he, he actually, everybody, he, they had him. They nailed him on it. It's a very small piece of what this entire crime reflects. This is a huge crime with many, many, many different um, facets to it. There's the property, property theft. My, all of my family's belongings were stolen. There's the fraudulent deed. There's, uh, you know, the breaking and entering. I mean, there, it's, a, it's a massive, massive crime that breaks out into lots of different um, facets. And in my, in my experience, um, there is very little coordination between departments and the powers that be in this city to work together to prevent this from happening, to stop this from happening. That was my experience. I was dealing with lots of different entities that were doing lots of different things. And even within the Department of Finance, obviously, there's a divide in information. As one, one uh, person, arm of the, the department, is saying, you don't own your property, you can't go in which in actual fact prevented me from filing burglary reports until way long after items that might have been traced could be traced. And when I was finally able, after the eviction, to report the burglary, I was told by the police department that that was an old case and that they were not going to investigate it. This is my family's treasury of, of valuable antiques, one-of-a-kind things that were worth roughly a half a million dollars, and were, were things that were going to be given to the city. They were designated for different museums, really beautiful things. I have photographs of them I can send you and all of that. They don't exist anymore. The legacy is gone. This act is now my family's legacy, to keep, keep this from happening to other people. And I'm rambling now, but the point that I was making is that the Department of Finance does not talk to itself. How can water and, and, and property tax mm. continue to bill me, to know my address, to know where I am, while the other arm takes away my property and says, you don't own that? I think um, that you've been very clear, and I'm so, so, um, I don't want to say happy because it's not a happy situation, but I'm... Um, proud and, and honored that you came and that you're here and that Councilmember Resenthal has proposed this legislation that we're working on together. Like I said, we are going to be following up aggressively on many of the points that you've made because a lot of them are like no-brainers 
you can't say that you don't own the property, but you want to collect. Um, so we're going to try to figure out what are the loopholes, the opportunities to improve, what can be done policy-wise, what needs to be done legislatively, and we're going to be circling back and letting you know um, exactly what the next steps will be because we want you to also feel like exactly what you read when you walked into this building, we want you to have confidence in that again because you have a legislature that, is, that really wants to be there for you. And I think that, you know, even though uh, it, it is daunting, we have a commissioner in the, in, the, in the Department of Finance who really, and he has come and publicly testified that this is something that is a very big priority to him. So I am, I'm, we're going to be circling back as soon as this hearing is over um, with recommendations. Just one other thing, I, I, I think that, um Every, everyone who owns property, and not only in New York City, but going back to the Magna Carta, right. has been able to show, to prove their ownership of that property with a deed. That is a fundamental factor in our economy, in our way of dealing with ownership, property, and money. It's fundamental. And if the city is not, when it registers a deed, is not guaranteeing the validity of that deed, but is charging money for registration of that deed, the city is then actually selling a fraudulent product. That, that registration is supposed to be our guarantee our certainty that our property is ours, it's our right, it's our way of proving ownership. And it has to be, that the city has to be accountable for that. And we just, I just want to be clear, we're going to partner and we're going to figure a lot of this out. We as a city are also a little tied by the state. There's a lot of legislation that needs to go in the state and we can attempt to push as much as we can and present resolutions and you know many of my colleagues have great relationships with people up on the state um, but I just want to remind everyone in this room that we need to start putting some pressure on our state elected officials to yeah. make sure to clear up some of this um, and to that end I've been told by a lot of people and I I can say this also and and introduce this by way of testimony uh, for example um, the district attorney of this city is very frustrated by the refusal of the state to enact stricter laws for economic crimes. There have been lobbying efforts made by district attorneys associations throughout the state that try to get economic crimes to be taken more seriously. I understand that there's a big difference. I didn't lose my life. They didn't kill my Aunt Beatrice. They didn't kill me. They took our property. There's a difference between violent and economic or white collar, whatever you want to call it, crime. I get that. But the fact is that they have, um, they've made me ill. <laughs> they've attacked me physically by taking all of this property. They've put me in circumstances that become very difficult for me physically. It's affected my health. And economic crime has to be dealt with more seriously. Uh, we, we need stronger laws. Daryl Beatty should not have gotten out. I, should not, I mean, the whole, this is another area I understand that I'm raising here that's not directly um, connected to deed registration and, and making that uh, more uh, assuring or, or a sure process. But Daryl Beatty was automatically released from jail early, automatically. Didn't matter what he did. And he knew that going in. I was the only person, the victim, who didn't know that he was up for automatic release. Yeah. I mean, it's, this, is a, this, is a, this is a city matter that needs to be changed. It, we're in agreement. We're your allies. And we're going to be thank you. You know, uh, following up on some other things. Thank you so much for coming to testify, Ms. Marin. We're just going to hear the testimony from this advocate right next to you. And then we're going to wrap up the hearing. You may begin. Good morning. My name is Marcel Negret. I'm a project manager with the Municipal Arts Society of New York. We are an advocacy organization uh, that works towards a more livable city and uh, helping shape the, the, the built environment through 
uh, sound policy and regulations. And so through this lens is how we've become familiar with utilizing ACRIS as, a, as an informational platform. And some of the comments that we'll be sharing today, I think uh, go beyond of, what the, of the scope of the proposed legislation, but I hope will be useful in understanding the limitations and capabilities of the current uh, uh, system. Um, the Municipal Arts Society of New York has a number of recommendations we urge the city to include in Introduction 1673. If amended consists with, with our recommendations, we would fully support the proposal. The bill must apply to all document types pertaining to the transfer of development rights and zoning lot mergers as a means to, of increasing transparency and accountability of non-discretionary land use actions. In addition to the proposed notification system, the legislation should also require a quarterly downloadable digital publication that discloses key real estate information from relevant document types. Finally, the legislation must require improvements to the functionality of the existing online platform, including better searching, filtering, and previewing cap capabilities. As identified in our updated accidental skyline report, which was released last Monday, we recognize the importance of improving online resources by making data standardized, comprehensive, and accessible. Therefore, while we fully support improvements to the notific notification system for ACRIS, we feel the proposed legislation needs to adopt the following recommendations to significantly advance existing usefulness of the platform to the public and effectively increase transparency with, re with regard to development rights and properties. First, zoning lot mergers and development rights transfers are one of the primary mechanisms developers use to build significantly larger buildings and avoid the scrutiny of the city's public review process. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the city lacks a platform that provides clear and accessible information about non-discretionary actions such as zoning lot mergers and other property transactions not subject to Seeker and ULERP. In its current form, the legislation omits these important actions. As such, the bill should be amended to specifically include documents that record zoning lot mergers, the transfer of or acquisition of development rights, zoning lot development agreements, also known as ZELDAs, easement agreements, air rights, or any other similar action pertaining to development rights. Second, uh, in the interest of increasing transparency to the fullest extent practicable, we recommend that the city be required to submit physical and digital notifications to the local community board and council member whenever document types pertaining to development rights are recorded in the office of the city register or at the Department of Finance. Uh, third, the bill must require the Department of Finance to publish at quarterly intervals a list of aforementioned document types pertaining to development rights. The database should be made available to the public in formats that allow analysis and integration with other existing property data sets, such as Pluto, uh, which is a land use data set compiled by the Department of City Planning. A according to this data set, there's 850,000 properties in the city. Uh, and I think it was disclosed by one representative from the Department of Finance that uh, there were 300,000 residential properties, and I think that's on an underestimation. Uh, it's probably closer to 700,000 properties in the city. Uh, last but not least, although property records and financial documents are posted on ACRIS, navigating the site can be cumbersome exercise for most users. The document type section of the platform does not allow users to filter documents based on date ranges longer than 31 days and lacks the capacity to allow users to search documents relevant to a specific geographic area smaller than the borough level. Finally, ACRIS does not display vital real estate transaction information without forcing the user to read complex and cumbersome documents that sometimes number in the hundreds of pages. The bill must improve functionality of the existing ACRIS platform, including searching capabilities that allow for a broader range of dates, such as years or even decades, allow users to filter filter document types based on geographies defined by community boards and council districts, and display the total number of square feet being, tr being transferred and the borough and the block lot numbers of the properties involved as a preview in the search results section. We believe with the with inclusion of these recommendations, the introduction 1673 will yield effective improvements to ACRIS that will greatly increase transparency and accountability and provide the public with user-friendly portal to critical information about development in the city. Um, thank you for providing opportunity to comment on this important legislation. Thank you, and we've been joined by Councilmember Gibson. Thank you for coming to testify. As you stated, your scope is pretty broad. Um, 
So while the recommendations will be taken into consideration, um, we probably will have to circle back with you on that. Um, Can I say one more thing? Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm very angry, uh, and I'm sure that my anger is understood, uh, but at this point, um, I'm also, uh, I, I, I would also like to express my gratitude, um, first of all, to my family for giving me some DNA that still allows me to be here and talk about this. Um, secondly, to uh, the DA, to Christine Burke, who really picked up this case, and her investigators, uh, Teresa Russo, who's in the Sheriff's Department, and uh, Inspector David, who's just, they're amazing. And also, I'd like to thank all of you uh, for hearing uh, what's going on and for moving forward to take some, to take a stand on it and try and change things for the better in this city. Um, again, I, I said this is, this has become my legacy. I get emails and calls for help from lots of people, including lawyers, including uh, city officials even. You know, how do we, what, uh, questions about what to do next uh, it, with situations like this. It's not over yet. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful to all of you for moving forward with this. Um, and I hope that it will make change. Yes, um, we are committed to making change. Um, and thank you for that, that we yeah. really very much appreciate that. I know that the sheriff is here and he stayed because I know they wanted to make sure we heard the testimony. So I thank you, Sheriff, for coming to testify today. I thank you all for coming. Um, and we will call this meeting adjourned. <laughs>